So, if you're just joining, that's great. Miranda, welcome. Uh, Tina, welcome. Um, Chocolate Eclair, welcome, whatever your name is. <laughs> uh, Danny, Andrew. So, there's lots of, uh, lots of new names. That's really good. Quentin is here. Good. So, um, if you can all put yourselves on mute, that would be great. I think that's the cause of some of the feedback. Yeah, good. So, welcome to uh, welcome to the first of our winter se a series of winter webinars. Um, and this one is is particularly um, interesting for us at WMUK because this year we've been focusing on trying to reach our newly diagnosed people. So people who uh, have been diagnosed in the last sort of year or so, um, those of us that are kind of like old WMers found early on in our in our journeys that uh, it was difficult to find anybody else with WM, certainly very difficult to talk to anybody about WM. And so one of our missions at WM UK this year has been to reach out uh, and try and attract as many newly diagnosed as we can. That's either through uh, leaflets to hospitals or talking to our nurses, talking to our doctors and making sure that you guys get referred on to us. So it's really good to see a lot of new names on my screen here that I that I'm not familiar with, which is fantastic. And um, the subject of tonight's uh, webinar is basically a guide to WM. So this is particularly geared for you uh, new WMers or reasonably new recently diagnosed WMers. It'll be a good refresher. I know some names on here are old hands like myself, but we can always uh, do with a good refresher. So I want to say a big um, welcome to uh, Dr. Shirley Dessar, who's going to be our speaker tonight. Shirley, for those of you that don't know, is one of our key WM experts, and she works at UCLH in London. Um, she's been a stalwart with um, WM UK for, for many years, uh, and I don't know where we'd be without her. She's just a fantastic source for us. So welcome to you, Shirley. Um, Thanks, Bob. Yeah. So... Um, what I want to do, guys, is let Shirley tell us uh, what WM is and what we can expect from it, et cetera, et cetera. And then hopefully at the end, we'll have time for some questions. So I don't know if you're all familiar with putting your hand up on this uh, on these screens or you can type something into the chat box if you want to ask a question. But what I would encourage you is you newly diagnose people, the, the guys that are new to this game. It's, this is for you, and if you've got questions of Shirley, don't worry how simple or stupid you might think they sound. Ask away, and um, I'm sure Shirley will be happy to answer a few of those questions. And uh, so without further ado, Shirley, over to you. And for everybody, sorry, for everybody's attention, this is being recorded, so we can watch it again on the website uh, another time if you want to catch up. So over to you, Shirley. Well, thanks again, Bob, and thank you <clears throat> to everyone for joining. Um, as Bob says, I've been in the world of WM for many years, actually. We have a specialist clinic at University College, which has grown in size. And the good thing about that is that we've gained a progressive amount of experience in this condition. Uh, and it's, it's a varied condition. It's, as I say, it's got many talents. <laughs> and so it can cause a number of challenges to patients. Um, <clears throat> I haven't actually got slides because I thought we could just chat um, and there, there is some material on the website which talks about the things I'm going to cover so you can look, look at those in your, in your own time. Uh, but in, in, in essence, well I guess I just wanted to do a slight show of hands actually or whatever the equivalent is. What um, are you all newly diagnosed or family members of newly diagnosed people? You can nod or, yeah, yes, yes. I, I okay. think it's, from what I can see, Shirley, it's about a 50-50 split on, on the screens okay. between yes, pretty newly diagnosed and some of us who have had it a few years, yeah. Of others, yeah. And, I mean, I'm sure you all had some variable experiences as to, you know, how you heard about it and you probably thought, what on earth is this weird condition? Never heard of it in my life. Um, and this is a very common experience in, in, as, as far as I've witnessed. People with WM, which is, is the short form for, for Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, um, are diagnosed in different ways. 
so some are diagnosed by chance because they may have a blood test for another reason and there's some discrepancy, anemia or some protein in the blood or something of that sort. Uh, and then they may then progress down <clears throat> and be told they have uh, some something called M MGUS, monoclonal gammopathy of uncertain significance, or or even myeloma, which is uh, a, a, a bone marrow condition that's similar but different to Waldenstrom's. And typically they will get referred to a hematologist who will then decide whether they should have a bone marrow test. Um, and they, if it comes out of the blue with no symptoms, of course, it's a shock because you suddenly are, you know, you suddenly have this condition and you have to learn to adjust to it in your mind, uh, even if you're physically feeling fine. Uh, some people present with quite a lot of symptoms and that's the reason they come to light. They're investigated for commonly things like fatigue, uh, shortness of breath, uh, weight loss, um, you know, tiredness, those sort of things, or increased infections. And that, I guess, is the other end of the spectrum. There's asymptomatic Waldenstrom's uh, and there's uh, symptomatic Waldenstrom's. But they all arise, all, this whole condition arises from some kind of disorder of the immune system. Now, if we think about the immune system, it's become quite famous recently with COVID and everything else. And everyone talks about antibodies and so forth. So our immune system is, is a hyper complex system that um, is designed and has evolved over mil millions of years, really, from, you know, pre kind of anthropological uh, states. Um, and I guess the production of antibodies is actually one of the more sophisticated ends of the immune system. We have the capacity to produce an endless number of antibodies to fight infections that we encounter. And over our lives, we encounter lots of infections, viral infections, bacterial infections. And for the most part, we, we do OK because the immune system recognizes these as foreign. They, it develops a little what I call a battalion of cells that comes out, produces antibodies, switches off the infection. And then they go back to what I call the barracks. Uh, Bob probably likes all these uh, analogies because he's a, he's a bit of a military man. Um, and they're not detectable. They just go away and they sit there quietly until we get another similar infection and then they come out again. Now, for some reason in Waldenstrom's and, and uh, similar diseases, this little battalion is triggered, but instead of going back and just sitting quietly beneath the radar, it gives itself away by just lingering and producing a protein, so-called monoclonal protein, which is copies of antibodies that this particular battalion of cells produces. Uh, now, by and large, it's been produced by accident. So they, they don't actually have any use. And in fact, they may have damaging consequences. They may, these antibodies, which are help, they, they help fight infections by latching onto the, the bug. They may start recognizing bits of the, the body as foreign and cause downstream effects. And, and so, um, when this happens, for some reason, possibly due to further kind of stimuli from to the immune system, this little battalion of cells gets further nudged and can over time can build up and accumulate. And as it does so, the protein accumulates with it because that's the kind of what it gives out. Um, and so the so-called monoclonal protein or paraprotein is something that is specifically measured in laboratories. It's not something the GPs would naturally do. It tends to be a hospital-based test um, and it needs to be specifically asked for. Uh, and so in, in this test, this, the, the blood is taken and the, the non-red cell part of it, the, the serum is sort of passed through an electrical gel which separates proteins, and there you are, you see this peak, monoclonal peak of uh, proteins called, which has become known as the M protein or paraprotein. So this kind of process just tends to be a cumulative one. And over time, some patients do develop symptoms because uh, this population is a bit parasitic. It just sits there, helps itself to your resources, and eventually may lead to um, a sort of reduction in your own proper immune system. So some people get infections and this can take many years and often does. So I think at the point of diagnosis, most people have probably had this condition for many years prior, but it's just been sitting there 
quietly, not undeclared, if you like. So that kind of, in a sort of nutshell, is, is Waldenstrom's. Um, the, the actual cell type and so on, you can read about that. I won't dwell too much on that because it's quite a lot. It's quite a lot of jargon with this disease. Uh, and I, I encourage you to kind of pick up some of the jargon because um, it helps you understand how you're being monitored over time and, and what's changing and, and how, you know, why doctors make certain decisions. Um, so the key things really are Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia is the name of the disease. Macroglobulin refers to big proteins, and that's those proteins that are produced by the cells. They tend to circulate in groups of five um, and therefore are rather large. So when, when the level of the protein rises, and what, what sort of figure am I talking about? Well, it, the normal scenario is you should not have any of this monoclonal protein. So zero is normal. But as you, if you develop a low level, it may be in single figures, but it can go as high as 40 or 50 grams per liter, so-called. And as it rises, um, the blood can get thicker and develop so-called hyperviscosity. So that is a physical problem that the protein can cause uh, by just sitting in the bloodstream and sludging it up. And that can cause symptoms such as headaches and muzzy headedness, blurred vision, uh, breathlessness when walking. And this can build up very gradually. So you, most people think, well, you know, I'm getting older, I'm busy, I'm this, that, the other. So fatigue that is out of the ordinary and progressive is something that people who are diagnosed with WM should think if they're not being treated, that maybe things are beginning to accelerate. Um, so M protein or paraprotein is another important thing to, to pick up on. It's this protein that can be measured in the blood. The, the, the level can be followed to see whether the condition is, is progressing. And indeed, when you're treated, it comes down again. But bear in mind, the number itself is not crucial in, in its own right. I mean, it, we use it as a guide, but at the end of the day, symptoms are the most important thing. So you may have quite a high number, and I have a gentleman whose protein level is 50, which is really high. Uh, and it's been like that for five years. And I keep quizzing him whenever I see him. Are you, you know, do you have any symptoms, et cetera? And he literally doesn't. So I have not started him on treatment. Now, I'd say he's a little bit unusual. But the key message here is the number is not everything. It's how you are. If you're feeling well, just because your protein goes beyond a certain level, it doesn't mean you need treatment. So when you're being monitored and this protein is measured at periodic intervals it's a question of you know the level of the protein the blood counts what your symptoms are all of these things need to form part of the regular assessment and they feed into the decision process for whether treatment is necessary um so i'll pause there for a second because there's a lot of kind of information i don't know if anyone wants to chip in with any questions or seeking any clarifications uh, put your hand up if anybody wants to ask a question. I've got to go between two screens here, but uh, let's have a look. I've got I Quentin Cornish. So mm -hmm. if you yeah. want to come off of mute, uh, Quentin, and uh, ask your question. Oh, hello there. Uh, my name's Linda. I'm Quentin's wife. Who, okay. Quentin's the patient. Um, my question, doctor, is um, you talk about looking at the patient in the whole, which makes sense. I wanted to understand uh, what the significance of doing CT scans is for a patient in that case, because that seems to be also maybe a factor in deciding on whether to treat or not. Yes, that is correct. So Waldenstrom's is primarily a disease of the bone marrow and the bone marrow sits in our bodies as adults mainly in the, the central part of the skeleton. So when we're babies, the whole bone marrow is very busy because you're growing. But as we grow into adulthood, the kind of peripheral parts of the limbs are just yellow fatty marrow. And so the middle bit is where the, the active bone marrow production of cells takes place. So Waldenstrom's is primarily a disease of the bone marrow, but it can in fact occupy other parts of the immune system. And the immune system, one has to remember, is, is literally everywhere. Uh, in terms, the cells circulate from the bone marrow, they go through the bloodstream because that's how they police the system. They communicate with other cells, they pass messages, they literally stake out 
potential bugs. Uh, and they also communicate with other immune, other systems in the immune system. Um, and they will sometimes sort of sit in, a, in the lymph nodes to have a break or to, to sort of mingle so that they can pick up and pass on other messages and things. Uh, and so if you do, if you develop Waldenstrom, some of, if, if some of the cell, the Waldenstrom cells happen to end up in a lymph node, uh, and because remember they're moving around all the time, they may set up a little posse in that node or nodes and expand that. And so sometimes rarely if you, because we have glands all over the body, many, some are sort of palpable. You can feel them under your arms or in the neck or in the groins but most of them are actually deep inside our body. And unless you've got a very large sort of enlarge, a big enlargement, then yes, CT scanning of the whole body, meaning the neck, the chest, abdomen, and pelvis is part of the process to identify the, the state of the problem, how, how much disease is there. And that is typically done at diagnosis. Um, on the other hand, if, if someone has a quite a low level of, of bone marrow involvement and they're actually quite well and you're not planning to treat them, then it seems a little bit harsh actually to do a CT scan because scans do contain a lot of x-rays. And so we try and be a bit judicious about when to scan, but certainly before commencement of treatment, a scan is important to get a snapshot of what, what, where the distribution of the disease is. And about a quarter of patients with Morganstrom's have lymph node or spleen enlargement. Now the spleen is, is a sort of a, a spongy organ in the left side of your abdomen, which is also very intrinsic to the immune system, but actually we can do without it in an ironic sort of way. It does protect us against certain infections. So if ever, anyone's spleen came out, they'd need to be on specific antibiotics. Uh, but yes, compared to many other lymphomas of which Walden's rooms is a kind, um, not lymph node enlargement or lymph adenopathy is not as common. But a scan should be done prior to um, treatment. And if there was enlargement, I would tend to do a scan some months after the completion of treatment to get another snapshot, because then you know what you've achieved. And similarly, the bone marrow is very important. Uh, one has to do a bone marrow biopsy in order to quantify the, the disease in the bone marrow, usually in a percentage form. Uh, and that can be anywhere between, you know, 20, 30 percent to even 90 percent of the bone marrow cells. Usually the more disease there is in the marrow, the less the blood counts are because they're being sort of crowded out, if you like. Um, so those two things are important. And the other thing about the bone marrow, which you may have may have read or come across, are so-called genetic problems, defects in the disease, um, mutations. There's one called MYD88, which is mutated or changed in more than 90% of people's WM cells, not their own genetic cells, but uh, so it's not an inherited thing. And there's another one called CXCR4, which is uh, mutated in about 30% of Waldenstrom's patients. Now these are both increasingly being done as part of the di <coughs> diagnostic process. And you will see in, you may see in some publications from the, the US, <clears throat> et cetera, that these mutations may have a, a very important role in the, dis, the, the selection of treatment. Um, and my own view is that um, it's work in progress. It's important to know these results, especially the mid-88, because it, if it's not present, that's rather unusual. Only five or 10% of people don't have it. Um, but if it is present, then the CXCR4 mutation is nice to know, but most British hospitals don't include that because it doesn't yet dictate therapy and the choices we have. In the US, I have to say that they have a different health system and some people may get everything and other people may not get anything. So, um, you know, I, I have a very clear view and, I, I, and the British guidelines, which came out a few months ago, uh, shares that view that it's, it's good to have these tests and we're working towards more and more hospitals actually providing them, but it's not essential to choose the therapy. Thanks, Shirley. That was a great question. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, if, if you want to raise your hand, if you on the bottom of your screen, you've got reactions. If you press on that, you can actually press the button and raise your hand. But while you're searching for that, does anybody else have a question? Uh, yeah, so Kathy Gaynor, 
if you want to come off mute. Can you hear now? Yep. Yep. Um, hello, hello uh, um, Dr. Shirley. Thank you so much um, for this evening. Um, I was wondering if I could ask um, the role that um, platelets play, um, or plaquettes as they're called in France here. Um, the, the consultant seemed very concerned when my platelet levels went down quite low. Um, and I think that was one of the reasons why uh, treatment was started. Could you explain a bit about platelet levels? Yes, of course. So um, blood cells are, there are, there are many types at different stages of being mature. The, the main ones to focus are on the red cells, which we measure primarily by hemoglobin, which is the, 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 the pigmented material that is what holds onto the oxygen and then releases it in the tissues. The white blood cells then are also important. Their job is to fight infections and they're different kinds of white cells. But the platelets uh, are cellular fragments actually that are produced in the bone marrow and they're really important to help clot the blood in the event of a, a breach of a blood vessel um, primarily. So what they do is uh, they, they're just circulating around. If, there's, if they detect some bleeding spot uh, because certain proteins become exposed, etc. They rush to that spot and they form a little plug. They then activate the clotting system and they then that forms a clot. And I think we've all seen clots in our skin. Um, and there's a nice balance between the, the obviously enough platelets should be produced and the clotting factors, etc. And, and I mentioned clotting factors as well because some patients at Wallenstrom's have become get disordered clotting as well, because that nasty protein can sometimes latch onto the, pro the, the clotting factors, which are other proteins, and sort of nullify them. So it's just a point to, to remember for those who get, especially a diagnosis, if someone gets really marked bruising and bleeding, then the doctor really needs to check for what's called an acquired clotting factor inhibitor. But I do digress a little bit. Um, platelets, therefore, we normally have um, over 150 platelets. Uh, well, that's the, the units are a bit longer than that, but, um, and the upper limit of normal is about 400. So most people are somewhere in, in that range. Uh, the lower they get, especially below that level, the, the greater the chance of bleeding and bruising. Um, now, to be honest, it, the rate of change of platelets in the context of accumulating Waldenstrom's is, is quite important. So if, if over, usually, it's very rare for them to just plummet although I'll come on to one reason why that can happen. But as the disease builds up, uh, platelet levels can go down. Uh, to be honest, in, in hematological circles, when platelets go below 50, we begin to get touch excited. <laughs> but you know, if they go below 20, then we get moderately excited and so on. So at the end of the day, however, it depends on the effect it's having it on the person. So it, you may have platelets of 50, but you might be fine. You may have no bleeding or bruising, etc. It just means the ones you have are working quite well. Uh, but nevertheless, um, if someone, if a dentist said to you, I want to take your tooth out, then platelets 50 is not really, it's very borderline. So we have to flex according to the level and the situation when looking after people with lower platelets. So then again, once again, the number itself is a guide. Uh, the context is important. Um, and when platelets diminish steadily over time in the context of rising, say, paraprotein level or anemia, then, you know, the hematologist puts two and two together and thinks, well, things are accumulating enough for us to say, let's rein in this process and take back control. And that is usually done in the form of treatment. Um, so that those are the role of platelets. It's worthy of note that um, Treat drugs like aspirin, which are in fairly regular use for people who've had, um, say, a mini stroke or heart disease, etc. They don't reduce the level of platelets, but they render platelets less sticky, and that's why they're used in those contexts. Uh, so, if you have, if you're on aspirin and you have low platelets, then the risk of bleeding is greater. So, again, this is something that has to be taken into account uh, when a patient presents and has low platelets, what other medication are they on? Are they on blood thinners like rivaroxaban or warfarin? Uh, are they on aspirin or clopidogrel? And I think this is probably why hematology clinics always take longer than they seem to should, should do, because <laughs> this is all the detail that is really important to, to take care of 
if patients are going to be well and, and as safe as possible, really. Um, so yeah, the, the other one I mentioned was there is, other than when the bone marrow gets filled up with, with cells and therefore the normal parent cells of the bone marrow you know, or blood cells are squashed, sometimes the antibody can target platelets thinking they're foreign. And you can get an immune, what's called an immune destruction of platelets. Uh, low platelets, thrombocytopenia is the term for it. Um, and that if you have immune thrombocytopenia, ITP, then you have to treat the underlying WM, but sometimes steroids are used to sort of boost the process until there's an improvement. So, so that's in a, sum, in a sort of you know, summary, that is what platelets are about. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy and Andrew. Please uh, take yourself off mute. You're still on mute, Andrew. Oh, the wrong buttons there. That's it. Yeah. That's, yeah. Have we got any information on WM retinopathy? retinopathy? Um. So retinopathy is a word that describes some disease of the retina, and there are there are many causes. In the context of WM, um, you can develop damage to the retina if the protein in the blood is, is particularly high and that thickness of the blood causes the swelling and engorgement of the vessels in the back of the eye. This can be worsened by, you know, if patients have diabetes or high blood pressure because that's chronically putting pressure on all the blood vessels. So it's a bit like a central heating system that's quite old. If you have a brand new central heating system with the nice rubbery pipes and water flows through it beautifully, then that's fine. But if you start pushing oil through a rather furred up creaky central heating system, you're more likely to damage things and perhaps get leaks and so on. So the same applies to the retina. And so that is an important thing in the context of high viscosity in WM. Um, you can get bleeding in the retina in that situation. The other really rare problem in WM is if, if there is involvement very rarely of the eye by the disease itself, that can be visible within the eye. Uh, and that would cause symptoms such as visual disturbance. Um, you know, that again, I must emphasize it's extremely rare. I don't know if you had anything else particularly in mind, Andrew. No, well, I'm, I'm diabetic, hypertensive, um, you know, everything else, and I've got a cataract, but the vision has suddenly gone in my right eye. And the um, mm. said there is um, retinopathy there, you should put it as diabetic, um, with um, exudates. Mm. So, yeah, that does sound rather diabetic, oh, but God. depending on your protein level, it could be just a little bit exacerbated. You know, it, push comes to shove, there's a tipping point. But at the moment, it's it, it depends generally on diabetic control, control of blood pressure and so forth. Oh, sugars. If we perceive, sorry. Sorry, sugars are good. It's always under eight. Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, it depends how long you know that's been there and what the what the average level of sugars is, and if you're if you have high blood pressure, over time, unfortunately, our, all our blood blood vessels get quite a hammering, uh, and they just are not as flexible and you know, comfortable as before. If you then have a protein going through that's, you know, just adding to the, the, the sort of stress that can push things a little bit further. But other than that, um, th there's no mm, sort of specific link with WM and retinopathy. Um, I, I would say that the key thing to protect the eye is, is if the protein level was very high, then we can take measures to, to lower that acutely, such as um, plasma exchange, where you exchange the, the plasma through tubes in either side of your arm, cannulas, and putting it through a machine, like a dialysis machine. Other things can happen, however, such as uh, macular degeneration, that just happens in some people. Um, if you have that, as well as Waldenstrom's, um, and if there's a change to your vision, then of course we all would we would check: is there a sudden acceleration of the Waldenstrom's in the protein? If if someone is receiving injections for macular de degeneration, then there's no reason why those wouldn't continue as long as you know your blood counts and things are fine. So, I think any particular eye problems is worth 
bringing it up with the hematologist, just, just as a check. Look, is it relevant? Do we need to do anything differently? The other really good resource for eye problems is our opticians, frankly, um, because they have really good equipment to look at the back of the eye. So what I said, tend to say to people if they have a visual problem is if they haven't had an eye test recently to get that done. One of the reasons for that is also because waiting times for eye referrals or any other referral at the moment is, is really long, unless you have an acute problem, in which case you need to go to a, uh, an accident emergency. And so quite often, if you go and get an eye test, you can get a very thorough examination. And actually, some people are actually diagnosed by opticians. Yeah, I, I, I was just going to say that, Shirley. I know of two of our gang that um, got their Waldenstrom's diagnosis from their optician sending them, you know, to see a doctor and get because of hyperviscosity mm. in their eyes. So that's a really key, uh, key message there. Uh, get your eyes tested. So I can't see any more hands up. Are there any more? Um, uh, yeah, Miranda's so chocolatey been, Claire. Miranda's been waving as well. I see, okay, Miranda. Yeah, go on, Miranda, then chocolatey Claire, then Karen. Go on, Miranda. You're on mute. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. Um, yes. I mean, I've been re I'm on what, what they call watch and wait. And listening to you, there seem to be so many symptoms. I'm immediately feeling every ache in my boat, back and everything. <laughs> Um, yeah. But at the moment, the haematology department is so booked up that I can't actually, having been diagnosed, I, can't, I haven't seen a haematologist. Um, I'm assuming I just need to go on having a blood test every six months. Is that right? For a well, who, made, who picked it up? Was it, was it the uh, GP? My GP, or... my GP picked it up. Um, mm -hmm. I had multiple tests with polymyalgia through lockdown right. and yes. the clinical diagnostic doctor in our local hospital picked it up. Yeah. So it's very it's low level, but it is still mm -hmm. Waldstrom's. And I just wondered whether I should be being more proactive really in seeing well, my pathologist or just sitting back and waiting. Did you actually have a bone marrow? Yes. You did, okay. Yes. So the answer is um, that if you're well, and levels are low, um, the frequency of follow-up is, we tend to sort of match, you know, we, we try and initially, what I, what I would do is, initially we, we would do blood tests every three months to start with, because we don't quite know what the trend is gonna be. But if there's some knowledge that things have been quite stable for a while, then blood tests every four to six months is, is, is perfectly acceptable as long as everything else is fine and you are fine. The point you made about symptoms is, is very common. I mean, honestly, and I think it's not surprising when people get a diagnosis that symptoms they may have just sort of ignored previously become much more relevant and they wonder, is this because of my WM? Do I need to do anything? And I'm not surprised, you know, I, the, the message in that department is if you have unfamiliar new symptoms that are progressive, or more intrusive um, and you can't it doesn't sort of square up with what you normally expect say from your arthritis or whatever else you may have then you should really seek advice from your cl your clinical team um, and you should well I hope you see your hematologist soon but you should be um, allocated a special clinical nurse specialist or CNS there should be a mechanism to ring your hospital and say look I have this and this symptom what do you think it is I have to say, I'm a little bit uh, depressed about the state of uh, of the capacity of the NHS at the moment, uh, because the, the help that we, we would love to be giving everyone has has really been put under a lot of pressure. That, that's no, literally I, a fact of life. Yeah, I have a very and, good... And so I, I do feel, yeah, I mean, I feel that well, I, I spout out this, this advice, but it doesn't always happen. Um, I, I know Bob speaks to a lot of people, but I'm not sure he can speak to the entire United Kingdom uh, WM community, but I'm having a good I go. would say if you're worried about symptoms, do have a word with someone. If you can't get someone in the hospital, run it past someone, because when you're on so-called watch and wait, which is the phase you're in when Just you've been diagnosed but don't yet need treatment, it's kind of now called active monitoring. Yes. Um, then you need to be com as comfortable as you can be with that, you know, because you've been given a diagnosis of a cancer, then you're told you don't need treatment. It's like, psychologically, it's quite 
getting your head around that's quite difficult. Yeah. So I think the only so thing, I think what yeah. you need to do is 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 have the opportunity to say, look, X, Y, and Z has happened. Is it relevant <clears throat> or not? And get some advice. Okay. Yeah. At the moment, it's just um, not getting ill and not being able to fight off infections. I think is the worst mm. thing, and ending up in hospital. Yes. Which is what happened. Chocolatey Claire is next. Thank you. Hi, you talked about um, blood thickening. I was wondering if that can cause things like cramp. I'm starting to get an awful lot of cramp that I've never used to suffer from. Mm. Yeah, the thing about cramp is that it can happen to anyone. Uh, and most people who have cramp don't have organ stones. But um, equally, it depends a little bit on, you know, medication for example if people are on diuretics then sometimes the minerals can go a bit up and down some people have absolutely no known reason for it they may just get up in at night and jump up and down because they got nasty cramp i think if you have waldenstrom's then i wouldn't want to say it's nothing to do with the waldenstrom's it could well be the thing is there's no way of really knowing until we take the walls and trims away which we can't can't really do, can't do. <laughs> so what i tend to do is be pragmatic um drink plenty of fluid yeah. some people try magnesium supplements which you can get over the counter okay if that helps carry on just according to the bottle not too much others if they really are troubled by it you can then be medicated with things like quinine sulfate um that means an, a tablet so you know it's you know in the way it depends on what the effect is if, if it's happening regularly every night and you're disturbed then i would say look discuss with your doctor about getting something like quinine to see if that helps if you i mean wm can cause nerve damage and so-called mm. neuropathy and cramp is one of the sort of symptoms of nervous system impairment because the muscle goes into sort of spasm mm. uh if there's neuropathy, then I would typically expect other symptoms like um, tingling or pins and needles, numbness, wobbliness. Uh, not, not all of them necessarily, but these are the other symptoms that make you go more in the direction of a neuropathy. Right. And again, if that's present in a more progressive fashion, ideally that needs to be checked out uh, because there is an association between nerve damage and WM. And if it's severe, even if the WM itself, in terms of its bulk in the bone marrow and the protein, if it's connected to progressive nerve damage, then it, it is considered a reason for treatment. Right. Thank, Thank you. you, Shirley. Thank you, uh, Claire. Thank you. I'm coming to Karen next and then Charlotte Bloodworth. I can see you're with us. I'd like to talk to you for a couple of minutes after Karen's question, if you don't mind. So, Karen? Yeah, thank you very much. It's my question is, why do the abnormal protein cell counts go up and down between blood tests? Yes. So the, the, the way that things are measured, there are kind of guidelines which all laboratories follow. Um, but nevertheless, there is inter-laboratory variation. So one, one hospital may measure it at 10 and another may measure it at 12, you know, and, and so the key thing is that it's pre preferable to stick to one, one hospital, that's number one. Taking that into account, there is variability between readings quite often. Uh, and that is because although there is a, an analyzer that measures immunoglobulins, the paraprotein level is actually done by a human being, believe it or not. Um, and that is another reason why it takes a bit longer for that result to come back in most hospitals, because they tend to batch them up and the human being the biochemist will, will read. He'll read a gel or a peak or whatever, and he'll make an uh, assessment of what the level is. So um, given that, what I would say a guideline for relevant or significant changes is, it depends in a way what your starting point is. So if you have um, a one or a two and it goes, you know, it doubles to four, that is not a huge rise. I know it's a doubling, but it's not a very big rise. And we'd want to see further readings and draw quite a long graph over quite a long period, make real sense of that. We'd also want to take that into con the context of, you know, is the hemoglobin going down? Is someone feeling unwell, et cetera? 
So quite often one sees, you know, if someone's got like the mid-teens of paraprotein, you may see a 10 and a 12 and people think, oops, that's going up. And the next time it's 11 and then it may be 14. So, so that variation between visits is probably down to the analysis, the, the way it's interpreted. So serial readings are important. And I think the doctor, you, you know, should usually will have a, a feel for what is a significant change. So for example, if something went up by five points, I would generally probably repeat that test sooner than I might have done otherwise, just to make sure that it's not going to go up by another five next time, and that it might just be a slight baseline variation. So unfortunately, um, all laboratory tests, all of medicine is fraught with, with little nuances <laughs> that happen all the time, because we're dealing with biological systems here. And there are many places where things can vary. So I think that the trend over time is really what's important. Uh, obviously, if it went from 20 to 40, then that's a big change. So yeah, Thank that's a kind of potted answer to your question. Thank you, Shirley. Shirley, take five minutes. I just want to ask uh, Charlotte to sure. show herself. Charlotte, are you there? Hello, good evening, everybody. Hello, Charlotte. So Charlotte is uh, a nurse practitioner at Cardiff. She's a, a big friend of WMUK. And I, I just want to ask you, Charlotte, to enlarge on what Shirley alluded to just now about our clinical nurse teams all over the place. Very quickly, what they are there for, how they can help us. Yeah, so I'd say um, every consultant um, usually has a clinical nurse working alongside them um, and I would say they're really um, supposed to be there for you um, they're your support uh, I'd say very much we're the ones that can sort of translate a lot of things um, from the technical words to the the sort of things that I can understand um, and really I, I'd say we, we've often got a bit more time than the consultants um, and we have got a lot of experience so you know there are a lot of things that we can help with or support you or um sort of signpost you in the right direction um but we have got that link with the consultants as well so so hopefully everything um that your consultant is saying you know we we understand it and um we know where they're coming from and can explain things to you so i would say um I am coming back, I think, in a few months um, to this group to talk specifically about um, clinical nurse specialists and nurse practitioners. But I would definitely say um, make sure you know who yours is, because we can be a really good support for you. Thank you, Charlotte. I totally agree. And for those of you that don't know, you, you are entitled to a key worker. It's a requirement for you to have a key worker. And in our case, our key worker, 99.9% .9 of the time, is our uh, haematology clinical nurse specialist. Thanks for that, Charlotte. And very quickly, Alison McKinney. I just want to introduce Alison. You won't be able to see her because she tells me she's just washed her hair and it's in a towel. <laughs> so, uh, Alison, welcome. Alison is uh, new to the WMUK team, but she is actually a nurse and she's going to be running our or managing our new uh, support helpline. So it's going to be Alison that's going to take a bit of pressure off me um, asking the more medical questions. So Alison, welcome. And thanks for joining us tonight. No, thank you so much. It's been absolutely brilliant to um, to listen in and and to hear some questions. So thank you very much for having me. Uh, thank you. And Shirley, does uh, we've got about uh, ten minutes? If it's okay with you, Shirley, to um, yeah, yeah, a couple more. Anybody? So I see Kamal. You've got your hand up. Yeah. Uh, hi, I just want to ask you, um, basically I had my chemotherapy since last year, uh, I think the September 2021, that was the last chemotherapy, our chalk chemotherapy. Uh, what I'm noticing that I still have like black um, nails, especially on my toes, that hasn't like gone uh, completely. So I just want to ask how long does it take to like mm -hmm. to get my nails back, I think, after chemotherapy? Yeah, well, that's a good question. <clears throat> we haven't talked much about treatment because today I've talked mainly about the disease. But of course, when uh, it 
goes beyond a certain level and is producing symptoms, then of course we do use treatments and they comprise at the front line usually a form of chemotherapy and um, uh, an antibody treatment called rituximab, which targets the, the lymphoma cells specifically. Uh, so these kind of treatments do, um, they're given in cycles and they do affect cells that divide more quickly than other cells. And that includes nails, uh, especially with, um, you said you had CHOP chemotherapy. Yes. Uh, we, we don't often use CHOP in WM. Uh, usually we use um, treatment called bendamustine and rituximab or dexamethasone, cyclophosphamide and rituximab. Um, CHOP in, has a slightly more uh, a component that is can cause hair loss <clears throat> and can affect the nails. Uh, yeah. to a greater extent but some people do get nail changes with all with all kinds of chemotherapy to be honest and but they are temporary to be honest to, to be frank um they uh, it takes as long as it takes for the, the nail to grow out in in in, in other words uh, so as long as the chemotherapy is ongoing you will have the recurrent if you like insult to the nail bed uh, but as the chemotherapy stops then those cells that are giving rise to the nail get breathing space and they begin to do their job again. Same goes with hair. Um, so it will come out and, um, you know, it, it can look very unsightly. I mean, the, the, the interesting thing about nails is that um, some of the newer therapies actually, so-called bruton tyrosine kinase inhibitors, sorry to throw words at you. There's a drug called ibrutinib, another one called xanabrutinib, which you may have read about. Although they're not chemotherapies, they can cause nail problems as well uh, in a different way. They, they tend to cause brittle nails. So I think we have to remember when, when people are on treatment, because it's, quite often it's given as an outpatient and some increasingly it's tablets. We almost minimize the effect that it's having on our bodies. But in fact, our, you know, when someone is on treatment, the body is so busy doing things to restore itself it's amazing how well people can look. I mean, you may feel very tired when you're on chemotherapy, but behind the scenes, there's a huge amount of activity going on in terms of repair of cells. And, you know, there's a big turnover of things going on. Um, and so, you know, I think in general, people cope very well, but um, most of these things are temporary and they do settle down once you've come out the other end and you're no longer at treatment. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Shirley. I'm going to go to uh, Chris Jones, then I'm going to go to Monica, and that may well be the end of our time. So, Chris. Good evening, Chris. J Chris Jones here. Um, Hello. It's, it's nice to be here. Thank you very much indeed. I am, in fact, calling from Germany. Lovely. And the, and the reason I am calling from Germany is the fact that we do not have anything like your, um, your society in Germany at all. There is absolutely no support for WM in this country. We have a very good health system here in Germany. One cannot complain. The doctors are there and available, but the care bit tends to get a bit um, bit lapsed. I I was diagnosed about seven years ago with WM, and uh, I was told at that time, "Don't worry about it too much. It's very very light, and the chances of getting run over by a tram." Is more is 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 much higher as a as a as a as a death result. Um, so I can I can sympathise with this lady we had about uh, about ten minutes ago, who also wasn't getting much support. She was sitting there watchfully waiting, but unfortunately, watchfully waiting can turn into watchfully worrying. And this is this is my problem. I have I'm. 73, I have all the aches and pains of a 73 year old person. What is aches and pains and what is where I am? Nobody can tell me. Hmm. Can I just quickly jump in there, Shirley? Just um, so Chris, yeah. uh, there, is a, there is a Germany uh, support group. And if you, uh, I'll put my email address on here and you, you email me and I'll send it to you. Okay. Um, you. Uh, I put a lady in touch with them recently. Um, Sorry, go on, Shirley. You want to carry on with that? Yeah, that's a big. Um, I mean, when I see see patients either who've never been treated or who are in between treatments, <clears throat> a common commonly recurring theme is, you know, I've got 
certain symptoms. Um, why is that? And do I, do I need to look into them? Could they be WM related? And my approach is really to, to take it one step at a time and assess that individual and what else is happening in their health and try and evaluate whether it could be a WM related symptom or not. Um, as I mentioned, WM is diagnosed in, in many ways. Many people are asymptomatic from that disease. It's found by chance. Um, and as we get older, we do accumulate more in the way of wear and tear and this, that and the other. So it's very true. It's difficult to distinguish between WM related symptoms and non. And I think there comes a point where you have a bit of both. Uh, but the doctor with your input needs to at some point make a decision as to whether push comes to shove and treatment should commence. Um, so what I would say at that point is, is, so I go back to my other point of, if you have general familiar symptoms that are kind of rumbling on but not getting worse, then they are probably not primarily WM, but as time goes on, WM may not be helping. Uh, on the other hand, if you have progressive symptoms that are really getting you down, then they do need to be looked at uh, in their own right. So, you know, you can get progressively short of breath if you become anemic, but as we get older, heart disease is more common as well. So in that circumstance, I would deconstruct it and say, look, what is the nature of your breathlessness? And look at the hemoglobin and then say, look, perhaps we should do an echocardiogram because stuff happens, you know, and if you have a heart problem, then we should pick it up and, and refer you to the right person. So it is kind of a case by case thing. And that does rely on on your, you know, you having, I guess, a good rapport with your doctor or your nurse so that you can feed in, get their advice, and, and they make they help by interrogating your symptoms in a way that is helpful um, and, and helps you to answer that particular problem. As for just the wear and tear of life, <laughs> that's a more difficult one to fix. I often say to patients, the treatments we give are not going to make you younger again, for example. Um, <laughs> but it is a tricky one, and it's got to be done on a case-by-case -case basis. Thanks for that, Shirley. And finally, from Germany to Ireland, to Cork, I think. Uh, Monica? Uh, Drogadier. Oh, Drogadier, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hello, Dr. Shirley. Um, just a question. Hi. I was diagnosed in June. And the reason the haematologist decided to treat was because my calcium levels were high. Now, I just, from reading all the stuff on WMUK, I don't see any mention of mm. uh, high calcium as being a reason to treat. So I just wondered, is that something that happens rarely? Or Yeah, um, it does happen at times. Uh, so if someone presents with a high level of calcium, we do seek out some of some other causes. So we check the hormone that regulates calcium called yeah. PTH. Yeah, that was checked, and, yeah. And presumably that was normal. Yeah, well, it was on the high end of normal, you know, to the mm. point of... Okay. Uh, I think so, kind of so that, that ambiguous. is hormone produced by four little glands which sit in the yeah. thyroid and, and they reg their job is to regulate calcium levels. So if that's sky high, then obviously we say, well, it's that. Um, if you're drinking lots of milk and having antacids, you know, that's a, you can accumulate dietary calcium. So, they, you know, they will have probably thought of all those things. Yeah. If everything's been excluded, then, and someone has WM, we would sometimes then attribute to WM, not because WM specifically dissolves bones or anything, but it may perhaps produce some chemicals that upset the balance of calcium. So we would check on bone health. We would look, actually vitamin D levels are very important anyway for everybody, by the way. You should all make sure you have a little vitamin D supplement irrespective of your levels because uh, we don't get enough uh, sunshine. I think maybe Ireland is worse off in that regard. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's an aside. Vitamin D is something it's worth checking. I, I do check it quite yeah, often. It did, in which which was kind of borderline them. low as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the answer is that, yes, if there's no other explanation for high calcium, then the next thing is it could be due to WM. Do we actually use that as a trigger to treat? It depends a bit on what effect it's having. So if someone's calcium is found to be high and the kidney function, for example, is fine, then I would ne not necessarily 
rush into treatment because it, it may have been like that for a long time just not being aware of it and your system may have adjusted to some extent um, but that again would be down to the doctors making that assessment so they would have probably done that they would have checked are your kidneys okay because what happens if you have high calcium is uh, it tends to encourage um, fluid loss through your kidneys and to the bladder and urine so you can get relatively dehydrated so one has to be a little bit careful on that front. Um, it's not often a trigger for treatment, but it can occur in WM, yes. Okay, thank you. Shirley, I've, I've got just one very quick question from a caller. I think they're on the screen, but very it's a one-line question. If you're taking a brutinib, do you need to be taking it with a full glass of water? Is that right? Or does that matter? Gosh. You know what? I'll have to admit that I don't know, and I would ask my pharmacist that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well that's what I, that's what I told. Of. Oh, I can see her now, Elaine. That's what I told Elaine. Yeah, check with the pharmacist. Check with the pharmacist, yeah. Elaine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, we've come to the end, pretty much the end. I just want to just uh, so when I talk to a lot of these guys, Shirley, um, in my normal sort of day job, I always try and reassure them and, and say that as harsh as it sounds and as scary as it sounds, that day of diagnosis, which we've all gone through, uh, you've got this cancer, it's incurable, but go away, I don't want to see you for three months. That is actually a good thing. Um, uh, the di Being diagnosed is a good thing because I say to the guys that from now on for the rest of your life, we've got people like Shirley looking out for us every three months or six months, whatever the case may be. So can you just... Um, reaffirm that really I suppose I'm, I'm asking for you mm. to to reaffirm that as a message that it as harsh as it is uh, it is a good mm. thing that once you're diagnosed we're under your care you and your colleagues care yeah I think the fact is it, it, it is what it is you know if a diagnosis is being made you can't unmake it um, but different people have different ways of coping and I have to say if I got such a diagnosis I I would be quite a worry to be honest because you, it depends a little bit on your mental, your makeup and the way you, you are. Uh, I have some patients who, who literally just put it in a box until their next appointment and they get a little bit worked up leading into that appointment. They get worried then, you know, you go in and say your protein's fine, they go fine and off they go. There are others who worry pretty much continuously. Um, and it's very hard to, you can't say to someone, don't worry. I mean, that's, that's a crazy thing to say. I think I think with time, most people in my experience get kind of accustomed to having this thing with them in their life. And I think what Bob says is, um, you know, it is, it, it is there, you can't not have the diagnosis, but you're under surveillance and for the vast majority of patients, things happen slowly. So it's very, very unusual for something, you know, you have to have blood test and the next time something, everything go pear shaped. Things do happen slowly. If there's a change, it's very uncommon to need to do something immediately. Usually you'll have another test a bit sooner than you would have done otherwise. So yes, you are under surveillance. Um, it's good to have a, find a way of mentally managing that if you can. And there are many ways, to be honest, of, trying you know relaxation therapies and meditation and you know all these things that people might do for other stresses in life um i think you do need to find a way seek help join others speak to others speak to your nurse many hospitals have psychological services don't be ashamed to go for that um i don't want to call out men but they tend to be a bit let more of a closed book um and you know i think there's also this thing between family within families because there's a lot of protection of the other person and the you know and, and I think again that is something that needs to be worked out most people live with Waldenstrom's for many 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 years and I, I get you that's probably why my clinic has I mean all our clinics have so many people in it because people for a long time they're not symptomatic if they need treatment they get treatment, most people respond, they then, you know, go back into the asymptomatic phase and so on. And there are new therapies coming online all the time. There's a lot of activity in this disease. There's a lot of interest across the world. And so, you know, in a funny sort of way, the future is bright. If you have it, you have it, but a lot is happening, a lot to be positive about. Thank you, Shirley. And that was a brilliant plug for our next webinar, which is Dr. Ian Jordan talking about the mental health aspect of living with cancer so check the website for that it was a good plug um 
Shirley, thank you so much as always uh, for giving us your time freely tonight. We do, we really do appreciate it. And I hope that some of the guys watching tonight have learned a little bit about WM and that you've put them at ease over some of their, their problems. So Shirley, thank you so much uh, for joining us. My pleasure. Um, nice to see everyone. Thank you. And there's a there's a few names on the screen that uh, I'm not familiar with, which is great, uh, but I want to meet you all. So um, you can find my address on um, on the website, bob.perry at wmuk.org.uk. I've met a few of you, but please introduce yourselves to me by email. I can put you in touch. We've got a great support system now. We've got 19 support groups around the place. Some of you are members of those. Um, where we can share our stories, empathise with each other, support each other, hug each other virtually and all those kinds of things. So, um, and just a final plug, um, I think, uh, yeah, it was, it was Charlotte telling us that she's going to be uh, talking to us on a webinar, I think, in November. But also in November, for those of you that don't know, it's coming out soon. We've got a patient doctor summit in Birmingham. It's going to be hybrid, so you can either attend virtually like this or in person. We would love you to attend in person if you can make it there. Shirley's going to be there, well, uh, along with it... a couple of other doctors, and um, it's on November the 19th in Birmingham. All right. All right. But the information will be coming out um, on the social media and the website. Chris, I'll send you an email tomorrow in Germany, uh, and the rest of you guys. I'm going to hang around until the end if anybody wants to oh, chat to gosh. me. I've got a, I've got a little while, so... Um, Oh, gosh. Shirley, thank you. And for those of you that thank are leaving, you thank goodbye. You Look forward to seeing you again. Richard thank King, you. make sure you listen to Shirley. She was talking about you there, talking about men being... Uh, <laughs> yeah. I better retreat I'm joking. Now. No, I'm joking with you. Okay, so thanks, guys, and good night. Good night, Shirley. Good night. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Bye.